right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Church of the Nazarene. Let's stand and worship together with He Reigns. It's the song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, love song born of a grateful choir. To the faithful gathered underground Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation Some were meant to persist Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples None rings truer than this glad to have you here this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have today to come together to worship you. And thank you that you reign, that you are over all, and that we can trust you with no matter what we're facing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Uh, We do have a a couple of announcements uh, today. Uh, In the foyer today is a gift card shower for... uh, uh, Adam and Aaron Osans, little Anderson, and then uh, 4.30 today, 4.30 today is the Discipleship Committee meeting, so a reminder for all those on the Discipleship Committee. Um, there, there was a repair to one of our church vans in the amount of 742, so if anybody would like to donate towards that cause, um, the, uh, the just market van, 
And then the big announcement today is a big, big, big thank you to everyone who helped last night at our fall festival. Uh, we had a great time. I don't know how many people we had between 100, 150 people down in the gym. It was an awesome time. We had a lot of kids come through who were having a lot of fun. Everybody I talked to said they had a great time, and I think it was uh, it was just an awesome opportunity. So a big thank you to all of those who helped with that. And uh, I know Pastor Julie's not in here this morning. She's work, working with the, the kids, but uh, she worked a lot with that and had a lot of help from a lot of people. So thank you for all of our helpers with that. And then this coming Saturday night is our all-church bonfire, which will be at uh, Bob and Sharon Holmes. Um, the address is in the uh, bulletin for that. Um, and if you are looking at that, and if you don't know where they live, I know that some people last year thought that 130th Street was north of Davenport. Theirs is south, and actually they had the opportunity to choose whether they wanted a Davenport or a Bluegrass, Bluegrass address, if that tells you where they're at in, in proximity. They're right on the line. Joe and Sally live just around the corner. I think you guys chose Bluegrass and they chose Davenport. So it's... Oh, you didn't have a choice. Okay, you haven't lived there long enough then. Okay, so uh, down in, in that, uh, that area. So it's going to be a great time. Uh, cost is $3 per adult and bring a, a side dish and then lawn chairs. And we're just going to have a great time enjoying the, the brisk fall air and uh, some great fellowship this coming Saturday. You like brisk? You like brisk? No, okay. Does it remind you of football weather? Yeah, okay. Speaking of which, I'm surprised you're wearing that Iowa shirt today. I'm, I'm just... <laughs> Loyalty, yes, I'll talk about that. That's actually part of my sermon this morning. And I'm not a loyal Iowa fan, in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> but the Huskers did pull it off by one point yesterday. All right, well, let's stand together as we continue in our time of worship. The blind will see, through you the mute will see, through you the dead will rise, through you all hearts will praise, through you the darkness flees, through you my heart screams, I am free.
As we come together this morning, I know that we come in carrying burdens and concerns. And so as we approach our, our time of prayer this morning, I encourage you to, to find whatever position is the least distracting as we think about how awesome our God is. I stand in awe of you. What does that mean to stand in awe of our God and to recognize how small we are in comparison? And yet to recognize that as, as big and awesome as He is and as small as we are, He cares for each one of us. He knows each one of us by name. He has the hairs of our head numbered. As we take advantage of this time this morning to call out to Him, our altars are open if you would like to, to come forward or you may be seated or remain standing. But I encourage you to find whatever posture is the least distracting as we focus on Him. And I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Holy God, you all praise you. I stand.
Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity that we have to come before the holy God and creator of all the earth. Father, as we come in out of the beautiful, beautiful fall weather this morning and seeing the, the majestic color, the leaves that are hanging on to the trees, feeling the briskness in the air and just being reminded of how awesome of a creator you are. You are such an awesome God. And Lord, as we think about how big you are, about how awesome you are, there's nothing for us to do but to stand in awe of you. To recognize your amazing power that is so far beyond anything that we could comprehend. And yet in your power, your extreme attention to detail. The details that that we recognize that cause the trees to turn different colors, that cause the leaves to fall, and, and yet we know that after winter, spring will come and these leaves will grow again. Your attention to detail is just amazing. And yet your attention to detail in our lives is even more staggering. The fact that you know each one of us by name, you know the hairs on our head. You know everything there is to know about us. And yet you still love us. Even when we've messed up time and again, you still call out to us and you, you want us to receive the love and the hope that you offer. I stand in awe of you. How amazing that is. Not only do you care about us, but you care about the circumstances that we face. Father, we pray this morning for those in our, our congregation who are struggling with health challenges. We know that there are quite a few who are recovering from surgeries, recovering from car accidents, recovering from um, several different challenges physically. We pray for Mary Hodge this morning who is struggling with a bad cold and we just pray that you would be with Mary and all those who are struggling Father we also recognize those who are struggling with relationship challenges those who are struggling in their marriages or with their children or parents and Father we lift these situations up to you as well for those that are walking the very often lonely path of grieving Father, we lift those up who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We lift up this morning Ross and Amanda Kimbrough and Ross's family as they lost his mother yesterday after a battle with Lou Gehrig's disease. And Father, we just pray that you would wrap your arms around this family during this time and comfort them. But thank you that Ross's mother has made that transition and is now with you and not struggling with the debilitating effects of Lou Gehrig's. Father, we are so thankful that no matter what we face, no matter how difficult it seems, no matter how lonely we feel at times, that you are with us. You are walking alongside of us. You are carrying us when we need it. And as much as we open ourselves up to you, you are, you are being what we need, loving us and living in us. And Father, today I pray that you would continue to speak to our hearts as we continue to go through this service. Speak through the music and in a few moments as we open up your word. May we be drawn deeper and deeper into this love relationship with you. To understand your love for us and to live as citizens of heaven. Father, there are many times that we don't know exactly what to say. And in those times, we pray together the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. us this morning as we sing Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my soul. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, now burst on my side. Angels descending, ring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. 
seated. All right, and if our ushers will come forward at this time, we'll take our morning tithes and offerings. Bob, would you pray for our offering this morning? Well, Lord, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us, and Father, we just want to thank you for the gifts you give us, the blessings you give us, and may you bless this offering. We ask in all your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. At this time, we have a special presentation this morning. Uh, Terry Calhoun is going to come and uh, do a poem for us. Terry has become a, a great friend over the last couple of years, and uh, we've appreciated all of his work. Uh, if you haven't been down to the gym in the last couple of weeks, you need to go check it out. He did a great job painting that for us. He paints. That's his mainstay and owns rental properties, but he loves doing poetry, and he does a fantastic job. So, Terry, bless us with a poem. Good morning. This poem come to me without a, an author or a name, and I titled it, and then it was too late. I had all new clothes, new sneakers on my feet. I was there for class on time, went to the back to take my seat. Yeah, I'm moving up. I've already grown. Soon I'll graduate and be on my own. I talked to some of my friends. They're all having fun. Said some things I shouldn't have said. Did stuff I shouldn't have done. I knew I was different. I felt God touch my heart. I knew I should set a standard, but then I'd be set apart. I walked to the bus, not looking for strength. I heard the car screeching, and then it was too late. I was standing in this room. I could see the heavenly gates. Oh, no, I should have prayed. I thought I'd have time to get things straight. An angel walked to me. He had a book in his hand. I knew it was a book of life. When would this dream end? I told him my name, and he began to look. Then he looked at me sadly and said, Your name is not in this book. Angel? This is a dream. No, I can't be dead. He closed the book and turned away and said, You cannot receive the head. No, 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 no. This cannot be real, angel. You can't turn me away. Let me talk to God. Maybe he'll let me stay. He led me to the gate. Jesus came to me. He didn't let me in, but said, Beloved, what is your need? Jesus, I cried, Please don't turn me away from you. As tears flowed down his face, he said, you know what you needed to do. Lord, I'm young. I never thought I would die. I thought I had plenty of time. Death caught me by surprise. Lord, I went to church. Please, Jesus, I believe. 
He said, you will not accept me. My love for you would not receive. Lord, my family claimed to be Christian. They were being real, you know. Then he said, I died for you. Now I have to go. Lord, I plan on being real tomorrow. I couldn't make him understand. I'd never felt such sorrow. And then it hit me hard. And I said, Lord, where will I go? He looked into my eyes and said, my child, you already know. Please, Jesus, I beg, it is so hot. This seemed to trouble and grieve him. And he whispered, depart from me. I never knew you. I fell to my knees crying to him, Lord, I plan on being real tomorrow. I couldn't make him understand. I never felt such sorrow. And then it hit me hard. And I said, Lord, where will I go? He looked in my eyes and said, my child, you already know. Lord, you're supposed to be love. How can you send me to damnation? He replied, with your mouth, you said you love me. But each day, you rejected my salvation. With that, with an instant day turned to night. I never knew such torture could be. Now, it's too late. If I can tell you anything, hell has no age. It's a place of torture, separated from God, and full of rage. You know, I thought it was funny and a joke, but this one thing is true. If you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, hell is waiting for you. Take a moment and ask him into your heart and into your life. Amen. Thank you, Terry, and for the very clear message of that poem. As we continue in our New Testament in a year reading this week, we uh, find ourselves in the book of Philippians and Colossians. And it's, it's quite challenging to me, to be honest with you right now, trying to figure out which book to preach from. Because I love both Philippians and Colossians. There's great things in both of them. And yet you have to make a choice. And I thought about um, just preaching all of it, but then I thought you guys probably want lunch, and then you probably want dinner, so I won't preach all of it. Um, but as we, as we look at the, uh, at the book of Philippians today, I, I want us to kind of step back away from the book. Philippians is one of those books that we've got a lot of passages memorized from. If you've been a part of the church for, for much of your life, there's several passages in Philippians that you would have had memorized there's in Philippians 1 where he says, He who created the work when you will bring it forth to completion. We, we memorized that one. We've got uh, my favorite, chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. But basically, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. There's some great passages in Philippians. But I want us this morning to kind of step back from the verses and look at the message, the big picture of what Paul is trying to say. Now, the church in Philippi was one of Paul's favorites. He wrote this letter to this church to thank them for a great gift that they had given him. And he wanted to, to really just tell them how much he appreciated them, how much he loved them. But in this letter, he calls out to a couple of things that I want us to, to see and, and see maybe a little bit differently. He tackles, uh, or touches in chapter 1 on this, uh, this issue of citizenship. If you have your Bibles with me and you want to turn to Philippians chapter 1, we'll start in verse 27. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Now, Terry presented in that poem the powerful message of the gospel. And, and what, a, what a powerful message that is. The problem that the young person in the poem encountered is they thought that just being in church was enough. They didn't understand what it actually means to be a citizen of heaven. Now, I'm not going to ask this question this morning, but I'm guessing that most of us in this room today are citizens of the United States. 
As I look across the crowd, we look like a bunch of U.S. citizens. And I, I looked last night, I was just curious, what does it mean to be a citizen of the United States? So I went to the U.S. government's website and found their citizenship requirements. If you meet certain retirement requirements, you may become a U.S. citizen either at birth or after birth. To become a citizen at birth, you must have been born in the United States or certain territories or outlying possessions of the United States and subject to the jurisdictions of the United States or had a parent or parents who were citizens at the time of your birth if you were born abroad and meet other requirements. Now, that's not too hard, is it? Basically, you have to be born in the U.S., you're a citizen, right? Yeah. To become a citizen after birth, it's a little bit more complicated. You must apply for a derived or acquired citizenship status through parents or apply through naturalization. Most naturalization applicants are required to take a test on English or civics. The United States has a long history of welcoming immigrants from all parts of the world. America values the contributions of immigrants who continue to enrich this country and preserve its legacy as a land of freedom and opportunity. Deciding to become a U.S. citizen is one of the most important decisions in an individual's life. If you decide to apply to become a U.S. citizen, you will be showing your commitment to the United States and your loyalty to its Constitution. In return, you are rewarded with all the rights and privileges that are part of U.S. citizenship. Now, that information is available to anybody. You go to the U.S. government's website. You can find that information. It's Citizenship in the United States is one of those crazy issues. If you happen to be born in the right place, not a problem. Or to the right parents, even if you're in the wrong place, not a problem. But if you're born outside of the U.S. and you want to come here legally, good luck to you right now. And good luck avoiding all the scam artists that are out there to take advantage of you right now. Now, I'm not here this morning to preach about U.S. citizenship, though, just in case you're wondering. That's really not what I'm here to talk about. Um, there's plenty of people talking about that right now, and none of them are making any sense, so we'll leave it at that. Citizenship, though, and the reason that I put this up there is because that last paragraph said that becoming a U.S. citizen is one of the most important decisions that a person can make. Becoming a U.S. citizen means that you will be loyal to the United States government and to its Constitution. Citizenship, as defined in our documents, means loyalty. Does that make sense? If you want to become a citizen, you are loyal to the nation that you're wanting to become a citizen of. In the Roman world where Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi, he writes to them, above all, meaning more importantly than anything that I've said up to this point, live as citizens of heaven. Now, if you've got an NIV or some of the other translations, they don't actually say citizen. They say uh, live according to or live with this in mind. Um, the, the Greek word there is actually politico. It's the only place in the New Testament is in the book of Philippians that this word politico is used. Does the word politico remind you of anything? Make you want to vomit from everything that we're seeing on TV right now? Yeah. Um, politics, or citizenship is what the way that this is derived. Paul is calling out to the, the church in Philippi to live as citizens. Now, citizenship in the Roman Empire was a very different thing from citizenship in the United States. In the U.S., as I said, you're born in the right place, you're in. Or if not, there is a process that is navigable if you've got the right people to help you through it and you happen to meet someone who cares and actually wants to do their job. So, citizenship is doable in the United States. But in the Roman world, citizenship was very, very coveted. It wasn't something that was just granted to everyone. Citizenship is something that you had to be born in just the right family. Not in the right geographic area, but in the right family. Citizenship was very coveted in the Roman, um, <clears throat> Roman world because there were certain benefits that you had as a Roman citizen that most people didn't have. As a Roman citizen, 
It meant that you were not subject to local law, but you were subject to Roman law. Now, how many of you have ever been pulled over in a small town? A couple of you have been pulled over in a small town? How many of you know the Andy Griffith Show got started from this concept? Uh, Danny Thomas Show. You may, any of you remember the Danny Thomas Show? Make Room for Daddy, I think is what it was called. The, the Danny Thomas started the Andy Griffith Show with this concept of um, getting pulled over in a one-horse town where the sheriff is also the judge and the justice of the peace and everything else. that. So in other words, every time he tried to... Um, appeal the decision and he just turned the sign around oh yep that's me too in the roman world there was an awful lot of small town politics going on because all of the nations that were a part of or all the areas that were part of the roman empire at one time were their own nation they had their own governing authorities and they did things the way that they wanted to do them and in that they still practiced a lot of those things. There was an overarching Roman law, but if you happen to be traveling through and you just happen to spit on the sidewalk, that's illegal in some parts of the United States, in case you're wondering. I think it's still in Louisiana. Sorry, Brian. Yeah. You do something that you don't know that's against the law, but somebody's there to catch you, and man, you're, you're just done. If you were a Roman citizen... You are not subject to that local law. You show your citizenship papers, they have no right to try you. Because you're not subject to local law, you're subject to the Roman law. Now that's a big benefit if you're traveling around, isn't it? Um, U.S. Senators try this on occasion. They get arrested for something and they'll slip their business card. I'm, I'm sorry. Enough of the politics this morning. It doesn't work in case you're wondering. A citizen could agree to a local trial if he wanted to, but he could appeal his decision to Caesar if it didn't go the way he wanted it to. Um, In the Roman world, the appeal process was not a guarantee. In the Roman world, if the trial didn't go the way you wanted it to, sorry, you're probably dead before you have a chance to think about it. In America, we get pretty uh, comfortable in our system, and you know we think that there's a lot of fairness. Our founding fathers tried to build a lot of fairness into our legal system doesn't mean it always works but they tried in the roman world that wasn't the case but if you were a roman citizen you could appeal your your case to caesar how many of you have ever thought about appealing your decision to the president of the united states what's the chances that he would hear us now this time of year because he's looking for votes in iowa he might think about it but but really he really doesn't care and even if he did care he doesn't have the power to do as much as we sometimes would think he could. As a Roman citizen, you had the legal right to marry another Roman citizen. In the Roman world, you couldn't just marry whoever you wanted to. Usually the marriages at this time were arranged, and you couldn't arrange a marriage with another Roman citizen unless you were a Roman citizen. At least not if you wanted your children to be Roman citizens. You could not be scourged or imprisoned without a hearing if you were a Roman citizen. They couldn't just beat you because they wanted to. And in the Roman system and in the culture at that time, that happened an awful lot. They were not supposed to do this without a proper hearing. Now, if you remember back to the book of Acts, when when Paul was in Philippi, some kind of uprising it seemed like wherever Paul went, trouble, trouble followed him. People would get mad at him. They would start an uprising. And in the book of Acts, it tells us that when Paul was in Philippi, he and Silas were beaten and thrown into prison without a hearing. Now, the people who beat him just assumed that he wasn't a Roman citizen. They didn't take the time to ask. And then the next morning, after this long ex- extensive story of how the earthquake happened and Paul and Silas were broken free, but they didn't go. In the morning, the city officials who had ordered their scourging and their imprisonment sent word to the prison saying, let them go, tell them to get out of town. And Paul sent back this message. Wait a second. You have just beaten and imprisoned a Roman citizen without a trial, and now you're telling me to leave town quietly? 
Uh-oh. You see, here's, here's the thing. In the Roman culture, when you are a Roman citizen, if someone does this to you, as a Roman citizen, you have the right to demand their death. So, Paul faced a predicament here, didn't he? He had just been beaten, spent the night in prison, and he could have sought vengeance. Because he's a Roman citizen, and you cannot do this. Paul didn't. He did demand an apology, but he didn't require their lives. Anytime you were sentenced to death, it didn't matter what you had done. If you were sentenced to death, you could appeal your case to Caesar. Paul made use of this. If you keep reading in the book of Acts, Paul has spent two years in, in prison in, in Caesarea. And the governor kind of wants a bribe is, is what the book of Acts tells us. And Paul doesn't bribe him. And finally, Paul just says, you know what? I appeal my case to Caesar. And he gets this nice long trip to Rome that we read about. It means that you have the ability as a Roman citizen that even when you have done something absolutely terrible that you deserve to die for, you can appeal the decision. Now, in America, we just don't even think too much about that because it doesn't matter how guilty we know you are in America. You can still appeal the process and drag it out for 30 years. But in the Roman culture, that wasn't the case. The, the, Roman, the prisons in this time period were very primitive. They were not designed for long-term captivity. Either you did it and you're dead, or you didn't do it and you go home. That was basically the two options in this culture. But with the Roman citizenship, you had the opportunity to appeal. And as a Roman citizen, you were exempt from cruel punishment. Even if you were sentenced to death, as a Roman citizen, you couldn't suffer cruel punishment or a cruel death like crucifixion. Citizenship was very, very coveted in those days. Paul was born as a citizen. Paul's family was from Tarsus. And it's believed that his family were tent makers. Paul was a tent maker. We believe that, that his family was probably tent makers as well. And it, we don't know exactly how his family obtained citizenship, but we know that he was born as a citizen. He tells us that in the book of Acts. So in that culture, there are a couple of ways that you can become a citizen. One way would have been that if his father or grandfather had been a slave of a Roman citizen and had been granted freedom, he could then become a citizen if, the, if his owner granted him freedom and citizenship. Or it's possible that they could have been useful to the Roman government. There was a, an important battle fought outside of Tarsus. And if Paul and his, or Paul's family had made tents for the right side of that battle, then maybe after the battle was over, they said, you know what? Those were great tents. They didn't leak the whole time that we were here. You're citizens. The Roman government would do things like that. And it's very possible that this is what happened. Now, I'm talking a lot about citizenship this morning because I want us to understand how significant what Paul is saying is. As citizens, it means that we are loyal to something bigger than ourselves. When Paul calls out to the, to the church in Philippi to live as citizens... He was saying, take advantage of what you have. Live like you have what you have. Because you see, the church in, or the town of Philippi happened to have sided on the, wrong, on the right side of a battle. And as a result, the town of Philippi was granted colony status. Which meant that everyone who lived in Philippi was given citizenship in the Roman Empire. Now, let me tell you what happened in Corinth, where they sided with the other side. The city of Corinth, in one of these major battles, sided with the losing side. And their punishment was, they just razed the town. Completely decimated the town. And then came back and planted it with 
Roman citizens. Philippi had been granted colony status. So if you lived in Philippi, you were a citizen. Oh, and by the way, when you were a colony, you didn't have to pay taxes either. Oh, and by the way, one of the main sources of income in Philippi was it was a gold mining town. Put the pieces together. You're a gold mining town. You don't have to pay taxes. You're Roman citizens. You have the ability to travel and to enjoy traveling without fear of getting caught doing something that you didn't know was against the law. Citizenship was very important. In the Roman Empire, if you were a citizen, you would be given papers to carry around. Um, you would have to register as a child within 30 days, and it took seven witnesses to verify that a child was a citizen. He would be given a pair of folded wooden or leather tablets that he would have to carry with him for the rest of his life, or her, that would verify their citizenship. And if you were not a Roman citizen, and you claimed to be, it was a capital offense. Immediately put to death if you are not a Roman citizen but you claim to be. When we look at this concept of citizenship, and we look at this in the, in the light of the Roman world, and we look at it in the light of our own world, I don't think we understand citizenship very well today. Barb brought this to me a couple of weeks ago. I had alluded to these in some of our, our Bible studies, and Barb brought this to me. It's a war ration book. Anybody know what this is? Anybody remember a war ration book? Dave, you remember a war ration? I, I know, I know. <laughs> some of you know what a war ration book is. During World War II, you couldn't have everything you wanted. And so supplies were rationed out. And this was... Somebody from South Dakota's, and apparently they didn't sell these things in South Dakota. No, I'm, I'm just joking. Um, that the little jab for my South Dakotan family members. Um, but there are coupons in here, and you would use these coupons if you went to buy something. The instructions on the back of this says this. It says, this book is valuable. Do not lose it. Each stamp authorizes you to purchase ration goods in the quantities and at the times designated by the Office of Price Administration. Without the stamps, you will be unable to purchase these goods. Detailed instructions concerning the use of the book and stamps will be issued from time to time. Watch for these instructions so you will know how to use your book and stamps. Do not tear out stamps unless you're ready to use them. Don't throw it away when it's used because you have to have this in order to apply for subsequent books. And then it says this, Rationing is a vital part of your country's war effort. This book is your government's guarantee of your fair share of goods made scarce by war, to which the stamps contained herein will be assigned as the need arises. Any attempt to violate the rules is an effort to deny someone his share and will create hardship and discontent. Such action, like treason, helps the enemy. Give your whole support to rationing and thereby conserve, conserve our vital goods. Be guided by the rule. If you don't need it, don't buy it. Now, I just like that little line. I think the U.S. government should adopt that one personally. Um, this was dated 1942. I, I have a cookbook, and I couldn't find it last night. I don't know where I put it. It's not with the cookbooks, that's the problem. It's with the, the memory stuff, and I don't know where I put it. From Harlan County, Kentucky, which is where my, my uh, grandparents came from. And in Harlan County, Kentucky, they put together a victory handbook. It's a cookbook that's designed to help you make the best use of your rations. Because certain items were rationed. You couldn't buy meat any day you wanted to. You couldn't buy whatever you wanted whenever you wanted. It was rationed so that we could support the war effort. In this, uh, in this cookbook, it also has other tips because one of the things that was rationed was tires. And in this cookbook, it tells you 
several tips to prolong the life of your tires. I have not tried this, but it says if you rub butter on your tires, it will keep the rubber soft and cause them to last longer. Um, Never would have thought of that. But let me ask you this question. If today when we get home, there's a bulletin that comes out from the U.S. government that says that we need all of our citizens to act like citizens and therefore we're going to balance the budget, we're going to get this down and we're not going to buy it unless we need it and you can only buy certain things on certain days. What do you think their response would be from the American citizens? I can guarantee you there would be a change in whatever election is coming up in next month. There's going to be a change if you try to tell me I can't buy anything that I want to buy. You see, this concept of citizenship to us means that we have rights with no responsibility. What are the responsibilities of being a U.S. citizen? What are our responsibilities? That's a good question. And I'm guessing that if you went jaywalking and you asked people on the street, you would get about as many answers as you found people, and most of them would say, not much. What are the requirements for being a citizen, or what are the the responsibilities of being a citizen in the United States? Pay taxes? Um, I don't know. What does it mean to be a citizen of the United States? We take it so for granted. And yet, if you meet someone who's gone through the naturalization process, citizenship is important to them. There is, that is something that they worked hard for. They have, it means something to them. I think Paul is probably writing to the church in Philippi to tell them, you know what, guys? You're, you're Roman citizens, and I think you probably take that for granted, especially if you've never traveled outside of Philippi. You don't know what it means to truly be a Roman citizen. You don't know the benefits of that. But let me tell you about the citizenship that matters. The citizenship of heaven. And what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? A lot of the translations translate this, live in a manner worthy. Now that's the concept, but there's more to it than just living in a manner that's worthy. What does it mean for us to live as citizens of heaven? Now, Paul usually doesn't throw thoughts out there unless he explains them. Paul says this. It's an awareness of the community needs. Being a citizen, says in chapter 2, verse 2, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of your others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in the attitude of others too. Or take an interest in others too. Don't be selfish. Man, don't tell Americans that one. So you've got awareness of the community needs. Quite honestly, very few Americans even know what needs are out there. We don't even know what needs are there. We know what we want. We know what we need at our house. But as far as what does our nation need, we really don't have a clue what our nation really needs. We don't have a clue what our communities really need. Unity among the citizens. Agreeing wholeheartedly. When is the last time that Americans agreed about anything? 
I could say this book is black and half of the, half the United States would disagree with me and say, nope, it's dark brown. We can't agree on anything. It doesn't matter who gets elected next month, by the way, half of the United States will automatically hate them. And then in four years, somebody else will get elected and half the United States will automatically hate them. Because we're not united about anything. Loving one another. Oh my. In American culture, we take that to mean jumping in bed with one another. That's not what he says. What does it mean to actually love one another, agape one another? To really care about people. To work together with one mind and one purpose. I would hate to see what would happen if this was brought back. What do you think the response would be? Do you think that half of Americans even care if they would be considered treasonous? If you don't need it, don't buy it. We don't have any clue what it is to work together with one mind and one purpose. And then the next part, To be humble instead of being selfish. Looking to the needs of others. It's interesting. I I went to a seminar yesterday on the book of Philippians um, by one of the professors at Mid-American Nazarene University. He wrote the the new commentary that came out for the book of Philippians with our denomination. And he was telling us in this verse where it says, Don't look out only for your own interest but take an interest in others too? The Greek doesn't say only. But almost every every English translation adds it in. Don't look out only for your own interest. It actually says is don't look out for your own interest. What would happen if you didn't look out for your own interests? I can see the panic on some of your faces now. And I can laugh because I had that panic yesterday. It's okay. What do you mean if I didn't look out for my own interests? What would that look like? See, here's the thing, if you think about it. If I'm not looking out for me and I'm looking out for you and you're not looking out, you're looking out for me, and we're all looking out for each other, chances are things are going to be okay. But it's that whole trust thing. Well, what if somebody doesn't look out for me? You see, what Paul outlines here is the expectations of citizenship in a different kind of world than the one that we live in. What Paul outlines here is what he expects of us together. I was reading yesterday in the Quad City Times website that President Obama is coming to the Quad Cities on Wednesday. He's coming to the Mississippi Valley Fairgrounds. And I'll be honest with you, my response to that is, what time? Is that going to mess with our plans because we've got Wednesday night kids activities? The President of the United States is going to be half a mile from here, and my concern is, is he going to shut down all the roads so we can't get kids to church on Wednesday night? You recognize how selfish we've become as a society. But we don't understand what it means to be a citizen. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think that we're going to 
be able to change the direction of our nation as easily as we would like to. But I tell you what I think we can do. I think we can change what it means to be a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. You know, Paul doesn't call out to the church in Philippi to go out and pick at the Roman authorities who are not doing what they want them to do. Even though they're crushing them. And Paul says that in this passage. What he tells them to do is, no matter what's going on out there, you guys live like this. Agree with one another wholeheartedly. Love one another. Working together with one mind and one purpose. Humility instead of selfishness. Looking to the needs of others. Man, how different would that be if we could live that way among us? How different would it be if we actually lived what we say we believe. Paul goes on to offer some examples. The first example that he offers is that of Jesus Christ. And if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality, excuse me, with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges or he emptied himself. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in the human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Did you see that I said that as a Roman citizen you couldn't be crucified? You see that? Okay, so Paul is writing this to a bunch of Roman citizens saying, God was crucified. Do you realize that crucifixion in the Roman world was such a horrific thing that it was profanity to even say cross or crucifixion? In the Roman world, that was considered profanity. How dare you talk like that? Especially to a bunch of Roman citizens. And we say, our God died on the cross. That's what Jesus did. He was humble. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He did not. He emptied himself. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. He appeared in human form. Humbled himself in obedience to God. He died a criminal's death on the cross. But then look at verse 9 and see what God did in response. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor. God gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, here's part of our problem in citizenship. Jesus knew He humbled Himself. God the Father exalts Him. What we have wrong is we think, I exalt myself, and then God the Father humbles us, doesn't He? There's confusion as to what he does and what we do. That's a big challenge for citizenship, isn't it? And that's a lot of what we deal with today. In America and in the church. We know better than everybody. And we're very happy to voice our opinions. Paul continues talking about what it means to be a citizen. He says, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desires and the power to do what pleases Him. So basically Paul is saying, this is what God did. When Christ humbled Himself, God exalted Christ. He's telling us, hey, humble yourselves and be obedient. God will give you what you need. Then he gives another example. The example of Timothy. 
Now, the example of Jesus Christ, I could spend weeks on that. I wish I could. And I wish I could go over to Colossians where it talks about the supremacy of Christ and spend weeks on that too. But then you, you think about this, who God is and who Christ is and, and all of that. Wow, that's, that's an overwhelming example. Of course, he also added that verse 5. Sometimes I wish Paul wouldn't add these verses. Tell me how awesome God is, but don't say this. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Man, I'm fine with thinking that Jesus did all this and that's awesome, but don't tell me I have to have an attitude like that. I can give you attitude, just not that one. (laughs) Then he talks about Timothy. He says, I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. There's an example of citizenship, isn't it? Someone who really cares about you. I'm going to ask you an honest question. Do any of you believe that any of the politicians that are running for any office really care about us? No. (laughs) I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. Then he talks about Epaphroditus. Now we know the name Timothy. How many of you know Epaphroditus? A few of you know who Epaphroditus is. Epaphroditus is someone from Philippi who brought the gift to Paul in Rome. Paul is in prison when he's writing this. Epaphroditus comes bearing a gift and gets sick along the way, almost dies, And Paul mentions him in this letter. He said, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, a co-worker, and a fellow soldier. He says a little bit later, He risked his own life for the work of Christ, and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do for me from far away. That's citizenship, isn't it? Risking one's life. And then Paul tells his own story. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one, a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law, so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, and for righteousness I obeyed the law without fault. Then he says this, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I became righteous through faith in Christ. Skipping down to verse 12. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Verse 17. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. And learn from those who follow our examples. And then he comes back again in chapter 3, verse 20. We are citizens of heaven. Where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. He gave us four different examples. The example of Jesus Christ. The example of Timothy. The example of Epaphroditus in his own life. They're citizens of heaven. They're living their lives as if they, their citizenship means something. And I guess the question before us today, does our citizenship mean anything to us? You can think of that in terms of the United States citizenship and Go wherever you want to go with that. 
But as Terry reminded us, there's a more important citizenship than the United States citizenship. And that is the citizenship of heaven. You see, too often in the church in America today, we act just as callous towards the church and towards Christ as we do towards our American citizenship. You remember, some of you remember, some of you weren't born yet, but you remember 9-11 and how patriotic America became right after 9-11? You remember you'd see a soldier somewhere and you would thank them? You're just so thankful. It wasn't just soldiers, it was firefighters, it was police officers. You recognized all the pieces and parts that came together for citizenship. You recognized, you respected people who put their lives on the line every day. And then about a week and a half later, when they went back to normal programming on TV, we didn't care anymore. You realize that almost every store in America sold out of American flags after 9-11. I had a terrible time finding one to fly from my van when I was living in Colorado Springs. But I found one and I went to great lengths to find it. And they were talking on the radio, such and such a store still has this many left if you hurry there. And we were rushing to get there. Because we were proud to be Americans. We wanted to stand together. And it so quickly faded. And then we started blaming. Have we ever taken our citizenship in heaven as seriously as we took our citizenship after 9-11? And do we recognize the consequences of not doing so? Do we recognize what will happen if we are calloused as Christians? Then we may find ourselves really confused when we stand before Christ, and he says, I'm sorry. I know you said you believed in me, but you didn't live like it. I just don't know you. And Matthew tells us that many will say to him on that day, Lord, Lord, but we cried out to you. We did miracles in your name. And he will say, I know, but I don't know you. Do we understand what it means to be a citizen? Are we willing to look for the greater good? Are we willing to to live our lives as if this is the most important thing? The U.S. government website says that becoming an American citizen is one of the most important decisions you'll ever make. I will tell you that it's not. It can be a very great decision. I am proud to live in America. I love our country. I hate what is happening in our country, but I love our country. But I will tell you that making the decision to become a citizen of heaven and to live as a citizen of heaven is the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. And it will not just be a decision that you have put on your tombstone. It will last for eternity. As our worship team comes and as we prepare to close today, I want you to ask that question in your mind. Do you take citizenship in the kingdom of heaven seriously? Is it something that you think about? And do you live it out? Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for the way that your word has challenged me over the last couple of days as I've looked at this passage and I pray that it will challenge all of us to take seriously what it means to be a citizen. Lord, the gift that you have offered to us is so amazing. 
It's absolutely mind-blowing to think that you would come to us as messed up as we have been and to offer us the unconditional gift of salvation, of life eternal. To say to us, no matter how bad you have messed up, I still love you and I accept you and I want you to be a part of my kingdom. That gift is so amazing. And yet we treat it with such callousness. Please God, forgive us. And help us to truly live as citizens of heaven. May we live lives that show others what it truly means to be a citizen of heaven. And let us recognize that it is the most important decision that we will ever make. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Live again in us, He came to be. The living word, our light, He came to die. So we be reconciled, He came to rise, to show His power and might. That's why we praise Him, that's why we sing. King and friend, he came to heal and show the lost ones his love. He came to go, prepare a place for us. That's why we praise him, that's why we sing. Heavenly Father, please forgive us for our callousness and help us to leave this place intent on living as citizens of heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you are-